One of the funny things about Rick was he would come right out and say no to an idea that I had. And then later on, as I pursued it relentlessly, um, he would eventually uh, change his mind unbeknownst to me. And the next day he would present my idea as though it were his idea and everybody would say what a great idea it was, um, which I allowed for. <laughs> Because as Rick used to say, a company can only have one head, and I certainly uh, agreed with that. I think one of my most fun memories of Rick is when they started the parties at the house for the summertime, and Rick had a specific shirt that he would wear, and it was this flowery-looking Hawaiian kind of shirt, and he would wear this big straw hat, and he would have his drink in his hand, and that picture alone was, okay, it's party time. Um, one of the things, uh, anybody who worked for Mobile Life there in those days uh, knew the radio code. Uh, it was called uh, 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 a, t a 1016 for medic one times two. And basically what that meant is, on your way back to the station, pick Rick up two packs of camels, no filter cigarettes. Uh, so it was, everybody knew that, and, and if you wanted the usual order from the deli, that meant extra rare roast beef on a roll with mayo and salt. Uh, he, he just, he lived a lifestyle uh, that uh, he would never be the poster boy for the American Art Association, but the man truly lived the way he wanted to live. Uh, I first met Rick Metzger in 1974, and I fully realized that's before the time that some of you started walking the face of this earth, but nonetheless, Rick was one of the instructors of the EMT class that I took back then, my first EMT class. And, uh, you know, I saw him throughout the course of the class, didn't pay too much attention to him, so on and so forth, and, uh, you know, got through the course. Uh, didn't see him again for probably about two years, 1976. We kind of linked up and got to spend more and more time together because we were both on uh, a couple of different committees of the Regional EMS Council program. And about that point in time, having the opportunity to spend some time with him, I really got to find out what kind of a human being he really was. Yes, he was a wonderful clinician, Nobody doubts that. Uh, he was a good leader. Uh, he was an excellent instructor. But beyond that, I got, I had the opportunity to know Rick as the person that he was. And as time went along, I got to know him more and more about that person. And I came to look to him as a big brother, a mentor, a level of conscience, um, and just somebody I could turn to when I wasn't sure what I should be doing next. Well, back in the mid-90s, I'd say, I worked at a local establishment, and I worked in the bar area, which was smoking then, and uh, I had these regular, this regular couple that always came in. And I'd see them coming and I'd run to the bar and get their drinks and have it ready for them. Loved waiting on them. And we'd talk, we'd laugh. Uh, just always a great time. I'd always have a smile on my face when they walked in. And this went on for years. They, they were regulars. And a period of time went by and I didn't see them for a while. And I was wondering what had happened. And, um say towards towards the maybe 2000 I was serving food in, in the other part of the restaurant and I see this woman sitting that I used to wait on all the time at a table with a, a girlfriend and I walk over and I'm like hi how are you I haven't seen you in so long and she said yes well my husband passed away um, of a heart attack on December 31st and uh, we haven't been in, you know, I haven't been in, and I was just devastated. I just loved them so much, and I was just devastated to hear that. He was such a wonderful, warm person, so easy to talk to. We'd laugh, we'd tell stories. Um, I knew they owned a business in Newburgh, but I never asked, you know, what do you do for a living? You just don't do that. And 
they were very humble and very, very warm people. The one memory that still stands out to this day, 25 years later, was when I was a medic student in back in 94, 95, he asked me one day, how are your grades? How are you doing in class? How's it going? And I looked at him and I thought rather proudly, I said, oh, I, my, my grades are, are very good, very well. And uh, what's your average? I said, well, I said, I have a, about a 90 average. And he says, oh, okay, good. He goes, does that mean you're only going to correctly diagnose and treat 90% of your patients? And he was that strict. He was that much of a, a student for being you know, true to the patient and always knowing um, your treatment, always knowing your patient. And he was brilliant when it came to emergency medicine. Um, working with Rick was unlike working with anybody else. Uh, when you went into a scene with Rick, Rick could tell you before he even encountered the patient what was probably wrong with the patient just by the way he heard them breathing or he heard them uh, coughing or just one look at a patient and Rick would know uh, what was wrong. He, he was an incredibly intelligent man and, and, and a pleasure to work with. When I first met him, I was totally intimidated by him. He was probably the smartest man that I had ever met up until that time, 25 years ago that I met him. Um, never bragged about himself. He was very mild-mannered, and I'm sure that a lot of people who are watching this are probably saying, you're out of your mind, but to me, he was. He was always very even-keeled, um, very matter-of-fact, but extremely intelligent, and um, I was always enamored by that, that whole aura that he presented. Until I remember the day I met Rick Metzger. It was in October of 1985. I was a brand new paramedic, the ink still wet on my card, and uh, I walked into Mobile Life's one and only station on Bridge Street in Newburgh, and uh, actually got a chance to sit down with Rick and, and, and talk a little bit about EMS and, and, and uh, me being a paramedic and how I would fit in with Mobile Life. And I, I was immediately impressed how quickly I became comfortable talking with him. Uh, that was one thing about the man I think everyone who, who knew him would, would speak of. Um, he was a mentor, he was a, a leader, he was well, all those words you apply to those people who are so formative in your, in your life. Um, uh, a truly amazing man. Uh, he was more knowledgeable than any street medic I've ever met. Uh, he was one of the first medics in, in, in New York State even. Uh, but uh, his knowledge of how to care for patients, not just clinically, but as uh, a, a true human being to have compassion and, and to, to you know, always do the right thing uh, uh, by everyone we encountered. It was, it, was an, it was an amazing man. For those of you who weren't aware, there was a period of time where it looked as though all of the EMS agencies in the territory were going to be gobbled up by these conglomerates and there would be one or two agencies left standing and everybody would end up working for them and nobody was sure how it was really going to work out nobody was sure about employment uh, no one really knew how the business would operate with that type of scenario uh, rick had a pretty good idea on how things were going to go and from Rick's perspective, one thing that was not going to happen anytime soon was a conglomerate was not going to take over mobile life support. So he had a very gentle way about him, though. He made you want to do things the right way. He encouraged uh, a professionalism because he exhibited a professionalism like no other. Uh, when he was out talking to people or encountering patients, you had the utmost faith that this man knew exactly what he was doing. And in fact, even in the emergency room, I witnessed many times nurses would say to Rick, what do you think? What do you think? What's the CKG? 
what do you think it is? Uh, tell us. And because Rick was so good, he was such a good clinician, but he was a kind person too. And um, even if he uh, had bad news, uh, he would be able to tell somebody bad news in such a, a, a soft and easygoing way that you kind of really didn't even realize it was bad news um, until after you thought about it. He was very big on treating the whole patient and remembering that the patients were, every patient was someone's mother, father, brother, or sister. The patients were not just another patient. Um, they were a person with a heart and a soul and a mind and a spirit. And he was always very serious about treating the whole patient and treating the person with, with care and with dignity and with respect. And I will forever remember that and I will remember his, his, his words of wisdom and his, his true dedication and devotion um, to the patient. And he will be missed. Um, at that time when he had his office where it was in, st in Station 1, I had my office in the old classroom. And I was the only one in that big, great big room. And he, coming in the morning, we would always know that he was there because there would be this cloud of smoke that would drift out of his office around the bend and into the classroom. And it would be like, okay, Rick's here. We all know that he's here. And he used to come in and sit with me um, they had pulled out the back seat of one of the fly cars out of Bob's fly car and they had the seat long against the wall so he would come in and sit on the seat and chat with me and I remember him telling me you know that I had a bigger office than he did. So fast forward to 2002 I take an EMT class out of the blue um, here at Mobile Life and at the end of the uh, course, I passed the test. I put my application in, decided to I wanted to work for Mobile Life. Put my application in. I'm sitting down for my interview. I'm talking to uh, Scott. We go through the whole interview, and he hired me on the spot. And then he started to tell me something about the company. And he started to talk about Gail and Rick Metzger and how the business started. And he said Rick passed away on December 31st, 1999, of a heart attack, and I said, I know somebody named Rick who passed away like that on that day. And Scott goes to his keyboard, types a few things, turns his screen around, and my hair stood on end, it was Rick. I remember telling Rick that when my father died in 1994, uh, one of the things I missed was my father's phone calls on Sunday nights. Uh, like clockwork, my father would call me every 7 at 7.30 every night, and we'd talk about how, you know, how I was doing and, and all those type of things. And when my pop passed, uh, I remember the, that hole on Sunday nights really affected me, and I, and, uh, I had mentioned that to Rick. And shortly thereafter, what I was finding is, is somehow, some way, Rick would be calling me on those nights. Um, uh, to, you know, talk to me about work or some other type of thing. Now, some people may think that was, you know, presumptuous of him, but it, that was never his intent. It was, it was literally just to kind of get my mind off it and, and talk about things. And he would make fun of, you know, how the New York Jets blew the game in the last fourth quarter. Or he, we'd talk about any manner of things, and it was just such a great thing of him to do. And it really meant a lot to me. And uh, I remember when Rick passed, I had that void again on Sunday nights. Uh, uh, the, the phone stopped ringing on Sunday nights again. And I just remembered it was, it was so sad uh, to do that. And I remember talking to people about it afterwards. And, and the best way to sum it up all of us was, yeah, that hurts. But does the having the hurt of, of missing those conversations with Rick on Sunday nights uh, worth the pleasure of having known him and known the type of man he was and yeah it absolutely was. He loved uh, his his daughter. He had a, a young daughter at the time who lived with us for a short period of time and he adored her. She was everything in his life. Um, Valerie, she was just 
the love of his life. And uh, he loved his mom, and he, 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 he just, he loved everybody at Mobile Life. He just, everybody meant the world to him. Um, and he would do everything in his power to, to direct people the right way. Um, if he thought someone was getting wayward, he had a way of kind of sheepdogging you back into the flock uh, <laughs> and making you want to do the right thing. And I, I, I could see the way people always looked up to him. Uh, people that worked with us um, always saw him as a mentor and um, just, there was no one quite like him. Um, not as smart, not as, 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 as charming, um, not, not as kind, not as gentle. He was just a great person. And people would call, patients, families would call and talk about how wonderful he was. Um, I don't think I've ever heard anybody complain about Rick in all the years, 20 years I worked with him. I, side by side, I, I don't remember anybody um, ever complaining about him. Um, I always knew in the back of my mind, in my heart, that if I needed something, if I was in trouble, if my family needed something, I could pick up the phone and call Rick and he would do whatever it took. And then we would go back to being little boys throwing stones at each other uh, because that's what we had to do. Well, with that, Scott decides to take me on a tour of the station and we get to the, uh, the bay, ambulance bay. We open the door and there's Gail standing there with her back to me talking to a, uh, some crew members. And I tap on her shoulder and she turns around and she says, what are you doing here? And I said, I work for you. Uh, it was a great moment for me. And through the 17 plus years that I've been here at Mobile Life, um, I always keep that in the back of my mind that I think Rick would be very happy that I was here working for him and for Gail. And uh, my only regret is that I couldn't tell him that. But I'm just so happy that I had the pleasure of knowing him, even if it was outside of EMS. He was a wonderful man, and uh, we think of him a lot. December 31st, 1999, uh, I remember that day like it was yesterday. Uh, I remember it was early morning, I want to say like 7.45, 8 o'clock in the morning. And I remember my mobile life pager going off, it was a numeric pager, we didn't even have cell phones uh, back then. Uh, and my pager went off, and we had kind of like a coded system. Uh, if it had uh, 4368, that meant it was mobile life business. If it said 4372, it was mobile life so social. If it said 4357, that was the emergency number uh, for mobile life, 5624357. That means call right away. And I remember the pager going off, and I looked at it, and it said 4357-911-911-911. And all the time I'd been in mobile life, I'd never saw anything like that page. And it definitely filled me with a lot of dread at first. I don't know if we had an ambulance in an accident or something dreadful was happening, but I immediately called uh, uh, the dispatch center. And I remember talking to John Donnelly, who was uh, the supervisor uh, in uh, uh, the comp center. And uh, all he said was, Gail just called. She can't wake up Rick. We have two Ricks on the way to his house. Um, unfortunately, though, Rick could take care of everybody else, but he didn't quite take care of himself um, as much as he should. His doctor was very frustrated with him for not coming in uh, as often as he should have, not taking care of the things. Those who remember Rick will remember he loved French fries with gravy and <laughs> Which, from Etty's, which he had uh, quite often. Uh, he smoked, unfortunately. I did not, he did. Um, and uh, he smoked camels. And uh, he just almost couldn't find time to take care of himself because he was so busy taking care of everybody else. Um, 1999, I poked my head in Rick's office and I said, I'm going home, probably not gonna be here tomorrow. I'm gonna take the weekend off. And I uh, wish him Happy New Year. Told him I'd see him on Monday. At about uh, 7.30 on the morning of December 31st, 1999, the phone rang next to my bed. 
Margie and I were still, hadn't gotten up yet. I answered the phone and it was Kathy Considine Sweeney, her last name is now. And she said, Ed, you need to come in. We have an ambulance at Rick's house and they're doing CPR. And I sat up in the bed and I screamed at her, Kathy, that's not fucking funny. And she said, Ed, come in and hung the phone up. That was the beginning of one of the worst days of my life. Uh, I remember almost being in a fog. It was, it was disbelief. And uh, it kind of really set in when I pulled into uh, the parking lot, St. Luke's parking lot. And I saw two of our crews uh, uh, out in the parking lot. They were kind of sitting on a step bumper. And uh, medics I'd known for years. And they were all just bawling their eyes out crying. Uh, and that's when I kind of knew. I kind of knew uh, it was going to be one of the worst days in our company's history. And for sure it was. Uh, I went inside and, and I met with Gail and, and, and some of the other mobile lifers there. And uh, um, Rudick had passed. And it was just... I, I can't, to this day, I can't put it all in words, the, the feelings we had. It was just like losing a parent. Uh, you know, losing somebody like that who was such a mentor to us all it was just, it was one of the worst days of my life. And, uh, I think that the world uh, would have been um, a little bit better if he had stayed on board. I think um, he just had a way of bringing people in and, and, and making them feel important and, and making them feel like their contribution was, was exactly what we needed. Um,